Hello. <laughs> Thank you all for coming on this rainy, cold night. Um, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to see you. We are, um, I'm here tonight to speak about kindness and the development of kindness in children. And I, as I've thought about this talk, I've thought that we sure could use a little more kindness in the world, don't you think? As I read the front page of the paper. So I want to tell you just briefly um, how I got, and I, have, I like to move around. I hope that's going to work. OK. Um, how I got to be here tonight, how I got interested in this. It's, it's been a bit of a journey. Um, and it began a, a few years ago when I heard Dr. Russell Barkley speak. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He's one of the um, foremost authorities probably in the world on ADHD. And um, he was talking about impulsivity with ADHD. And one of the things he said was that people can forgive a lot of things, but they can't forgive anger. And that was like kind of a whoa for me. I was like um, just blown away. I had not thought about that in that context. So I began to think a lot about, he was, the whole talk was on emotional dysregulation and how kids with ADHD have dysregulation problems with mood. And I got very interested in that topic. How do you help people regulate your emotions, regulate their emotions? It's not only anger, it's all of them. So uh, Kathleen Nadeau and I co-authored that first book. And as part of that, she inserted a page about empathy. And she inserted, um, and the cartoonist wrote, a, I think, a, a wonderful cartoon about um, how empathy can help you reduce your uh, anger, can lower your anger. And I, I found myself thinking about that. How? And how is it that having empathy for somebody can help you reduce your anger? So I started thinking about that. Um, and so that's been kind of my journey. And then as part of that, I realized that what I've really been thinking about is emotional intelligence or social emotional intelligence. Those are the things that, um, that those are, what, what is involved is the uh, ability to understand your emotions, to label your emotions, to label those of other people, to take the perspective of another. Um, and these are all ways that we can deal with emotions and get along better with other people. So um, I'm going to tell you a story uh, from my own life, a true story, that I will then come back to periodically. Um, but it was a very important story in my life that um, was part of my journey here. Um, and as I say, this is a true story. My husband and I happen to love the ballet. We just both of us independently love the ballet. And we are season ticket holders to the Kennedy Center. And uh, we were a few years ago seeing the, then, and all of these are relevant facts and it will relate, I promise, to, the, to this topic. The, um, we were seeing the San Francisco ballet dance Romeo and Juliet. And the ballet Romeo and Juliet is very much like Shakespeare's play. It's the same basic plot. So we arrive, and we happen to have front row seats, which actually, um, be, anyway, I don't like an obstructed view, so we, we get, this is our splurge. And we uh, arrive for the performance, and in row two behind us are a five-year-old and three-year-old with their mother, and they're sitting on these cushions. And I'm like, my reaction, first of all, is, oh, no. Why are there children, little kids? This is really inappropriate. And then I'm thinking, this is really not the ballet you would bring little kids to. I mean, just like at the end of Romeo and of the Shakespeare play, there's dead bodies all over the stage at the end of the play and throughout the play, right? So why have they brought these little kids to this performance? It turned out later my husband was having the same thought. So at the end of the first act, there's an intermission, and my husband is a very social being, and he turns to the person next to him, and he starts taking up a conversation with her. And it turns out, and he says, you know, um, and what brought you here tonight? And she said, oh, my son is playing Mercutio, which is one of the major roles in Romeo and Juliet. And oh, he said, oh, you know, how nice, and they got to chatting. And then 
she told him that in the row behind us were his children and, and their mother, her, her daughter, daughter-in-law, and that they had traveled, that they'd never seen their father dance before because he dances in San Francisco and they lived on the East Coast. And so this was their first time they were going to see their father dance well. My, any annoyance I felt just, it was like you took a, you know, a needle and poked a balloon and just um, dropped away. And then, at the almost the same mo moment, my husband and I looked at each other and said, oh no, Mercutio is going to die in the next scene in a very violent, awful death by sword. You know, we got to make sure they know. And yes, it turned out we talked to the mother and the grandmother, and yes, they were very aware that their father was going to die, but it was all pretend, and um, all was well that ended well, to quote another Shakespeare play. Um, and the other thing that was interesting to me, there were several parts to this, which I will talk about some more. Um, instead of being annoyed that there were children there, I was turning around and saying, can they see? Can, can, you know, can they see? So the, the important points here today for me are about this story and how I, I think about it is that, or that um, we, if we change how we think about things, we change how we feel, we can change how we feel about things, which can change how we act towards other people. And so instead of turning around and saying something mean or nasty or, you know, hopefully I wouldn't have done that, I inhibited myself, but that instead of saying something like, could they be quiet, please, they're rustling papers, instead, based on my change in perspective, I was able to change how I thought and felt and behaved towards them. And in turn, they were very friendly with us throughout the rest of the performance. So, okay, so why do I tell you this story? Because I feel that this exemplifies for you how we can learn to be kind and understand things from a different perspective. That's really what I mean by understand differences. And that I think it is really vital for our children and to learn these, uh, these skills. So here are uh, the three main points that I would like to bring to you today. The, the first point, key point, is that um, I want you to know, I'm going to summarize some research for you, that people who actually can do these things, who have empathy, who get along well with other people, actually do better in life. They tend to do better as kids. They don't have as many behavior problems. They get along with peers. They get along with teachers. And, and, and that carries through to adulthood. They get along better in the workplace. Uh, so this, is, this carries along. So that's one important point. So this is a skill worth working on. The second important key point is that in order to, to do this, in order to get along with other people, we have to be able to put ourselves in their shoes, to see things from their perspective, and to try to understand how they think and feel. So, and that is actually the definition of empathy. The Merriam-Webster definition of empathy is to be able to understand things, how p other people, how another person thinks and feels, basically without having to be told. And so it's not only feeling, it's, it's thinking. Um, and the key point number three is that people have varying abilities at this skill, at, at being able to take perspective of another person and imagine how they might think or feel. And I see it as a broad continuum from people who really have significant difficulty with, with that skill to people actually who have too much empathy and are usually oftentimes psychologists and other medical professionals who burn out uh, because they have so much empathy they can put themselves in another's shoes almost too much. And then there's everybody in between. Uh, 
with varying degrees of, of these skills. But the bottom line to me is that these are important skills and that they can be taught. This was another important uh, conversation I had along my, the way was with another psychologist who argued with me that empathy is something innate and that it can't be taught. There uh, is some, people have looked into that. There does seem to certainly be a genetic connection um, to the capacity to experience empathy, to do perspective taking, to take the perspective of another. But uh, there's also environmental influences. And so I think that, and we also know now that the, the brain can change. Neuroplasticity is, is one of the big words right now in the field of neuropsychology, that the brain is not fixed at birth, is certainly, and it's not, it, that we can have a growth mindset, not a fixed mindset, the idea that people can grow. And I think that's a more optimistic way of looking at, um, at the world, at, at people. And there actually have been a number of curriculums for school that have grown up now to teach social emotional learning. SEL is the short, um, the, the acronym for it. Um, I think in probably in response to bullying, but in your handouts are some resources for some of the curriculum. One of them is called the kindness curriculum. Um, it's a 12 week program. Anyway, there are a number of different school curriculum, but from everything I've read, and, and thought and, and uh, thought about, it, it does start at home. And it starts in the relationship with, with our homes, uh, with, our, with our families. And so I guess when I think about kindness and I think about the fact that I feel like we need more kindness in the world, I'm, maybe this is grandiose, but, um, I feel like I want us, we want to start one child at a time, one family at a time, and maybe one school at a time. But maybe we could bring some more kindness into the world uh, if we can follow some of these steps. I do believe this is a teachable skill. Now, one thing that I often run into uh, some confusion, parents will say, well, um, he has a lot of uh, empathy. Uh, if I'm, you know, if I'm not feeling well, he'll come over and, and offer me, you know, a hug or a kiss or a, a glass of water, or, and and that is all lovely. It is wonderful, and it's it's sympathy, and there is a there is a difference between empathy and sympathy, and this is something that is uh, a big thing in in this field. And I have a little video clip that I, I would like to show you about this. It's very short. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. 
we're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So what'd you think? Pretty, pretty good, I think. I think it says a lot. Okay. And actually what I think I'd like to do is pick up on that theme that uh, some people need instruction, they need help learning how to do this, this thing we call empathy. Um, and so I was thinking of what are the, I've been thinking about what are the building blocks of empathy. And the building blocks in the video largely have to do with, with feelings and understanding feelings and how we deal with, with it when other people uh, share their feelings with us. I'm going to start with uh, one of the, I think, key building blocks of, of empathy, which is the ability to take the perspective of another person and to see that their situation might be different than yours or that they might see the same situation differently. So in the example of the ballet, I had a 180 degree turnaround when I understood things differently. But that's not always how it works in real life. Now this is something that I use in my office all the time. So for example, let's, let's take a um, child and a mom who are having a fight about, I'm sure none of you knows anything about child and parent, I don't know how many parents are here tonight, or most of you parents, teachers? Okay. Um, so it could be a student and you having a fight over, over grades. But um, take the same situation and let's look at it from each person's perspective. So here's a piece of cheese. And if I am the mouse on top, laser pointer, if I'm the mouse on top, I'm going to see that as a triangle. If I'm this guy, I don't know what he is, I'm going to see uh, sort of a vague rectangle, parallelogram. The uh, math teachers here would know specifically. It's irregular. And if I'm this guy here, I'm going to see a kind of squarish thing. Same piece of cheese, but triangle, rectangle, square, depending on which angle you're looking at it from. The same thing is true, let's take a sporting event. Uh, if, if you're at a football game and you've got, you're the player on the field, you're going to see it one way. If you're sitting on the 50-yard line, you're going to see it another way. And if you're sitting behind a goalpost, you'll see it another way. So the same, take the same situation and you're going to see it from different perspectives. And this is something actually that I draw on a board and work with families on. So for example, I insist that people take five minutes to tell their side of, the, of what they were feeling, their perspective, and I have the other person sit and just listen without interrupting, without, interrupting, without rolling their eyes, without um, getting up and leaving the room. They have to just sit and listen, and then they'll get their, I actually set a timer, and then we, we change roles. The other person does the same thing. This just happened in my office last week. Mom, mom and daughter had had a disagreement and each one, when we got down to it, you could see that it was the same situation, but each person had a totally different perspective on what had happened. Uh, the child wanted more freedom and is young and the mother was feeling protective and I could see both perspectives, same point of view. 
what was important was not that I could see them, but that instead of yelling at each other, they could actually just sit there and understand, listen, listen to the other person's point of view. And as in the clip, the video clip we just saw, the important point is some, sometimes just the listening and the understanding. Feeling understood is a goal, is something that one of the key things most of us want in life is to feel understood by another person. And so I think that uh, in using this perspective, uh, that taking this idea that the same thing can be viewed different ways can be extremely helpful. Uh, and I think it's important for kids to get this. I think one can also use this with sibling fighting, um, where they, they have a fight. Your kids might be having a fight, or kids in a classroom, and you sit them opposite each other, and each one has to sit and listen while the other one tells their side of their, their perspective. It's not their side of the story. It's their perspective, their reality. The other, another building block, and a very important building block, is understanding your own feelings and being able to label them. And this is, can be really difficult for many kids. Uh, alexithymia is a term for a specific learning disability that has to do with being able to label your own emotions. But some children and some adults that I have met have diffi tremendous difficulty talking about their feelings, even though it's, it's not a specific learning disability. And for people who have difficulty in this area, it's very important that they learn to associate their physiological internal cues with an emotional label. That is, um, that is a key thing that people need to do in order to develop emotional intelligence um, and to, to develop this area of skill. So um, some of the core emotions that have been written about as there, there are many different lists of what are the key emotions, but I would start certainly um, with the following ones, which are happy, which, which of course is everybody's favorite. Um, and in this one picture, you've got both angry and sad. You've got um, this poor little boy who's trying to do his homework, and his parents, to me, look like they're arguing in the background. Um, and I'm wondering, wondering what he's feeling. And I'm wondering what he could talk about, about what he's feeling. And then scared is another of the core emotions that uh, have been written about. Some of the others are disgust, surprise. Uh, those are kind of the most basic emotional states. And it's, um, it's important to learn to recognize them. But then it's also important to learn to recognize the feelings of other people. How do we tell what other people are feeling? And oftentimes, we need to do that by understanding nonverbal cues. So the nonverbal cues would be facial, using your, all of your senses. How does the person's tone of voice sound? How does the person's face look? What do you think this little one is feeling right there? I think from nonverbal cues. I will often think with kids, teenagers, and other kids about how their nonverbal behavior, how, what do they think the impact of that is on how other people see them? Do you think if you're sitting in your chair like this, is anybody going to want to come over and approach you to make friends? What do you think, how do you think you would react if you saw somebody sitting with a scowl on their face? And usually that at least elicits a, a, a response of wanting to avoid that person. Another very important building block is understanding the impact that our behavior has on other people. This is something that many kids don't get. Um, many people don't get. Um, and sometimes we don't know the impact of our behavior on other people. Uh, so, and when you put these all together, let me explain what this is. This is a, and you have it in your handout. Um, this is a combination of two things. This is that I put together. 
This is uh, cognitive behavior therapy. I don't know if anybody is familiar with cognitive behavior therapy, but it is the idea that I've been talking about, which is the, um, you can, the idea that you can, if you change how you think about something, you can change how you feel about something. And I think it also leads to you can change what you do about it, your actions. And then I combine that with Michelle Garcia Winner's social behavior mapping. I don't know if any of you is familiar with, social, with um, Michelle Garcia Winner, but she's done a, a lot of thinking about perspective taking and a lot of what uh, I've been talking about. And she has put together something she calls the social behavior map, which is understanding the impact of, that your behavior has on other people. So I put this together and call it a thought and behavior record. And um, this is a, from a, a real story, uh, a, a boy named Jack, not his real name. I will use no real names. And what we did was we wrote down the event that had happened where the kids were calling him names in school. And what he, is, he had some automatic negative thoughts about that, which is in cognitive behavior therapy, terms, we think that people often have these kind of automatic negative thoughts that jump into their heads that cause them to have certain feelings. And so his automatic negative thoughts were those kids are jerks and his feeling was angry. And then what he did with that was he yelled at them and called them jerks. So that was his action. So I asked him what he thought they thought and felt about him now. And he said, well, they think I'm a jerk. And I said, what did they do towards you? They mocked me. And then how did you feel? I felt angrier and ashamed. I feel like crying. And then he, I said, how does that, if, when you feel angry and ashamed and feel like crying, how do you treat other people? I yell at them and throw things. And of course, that did happen, and he did get in trouble at school, as you can imagine. So the way I think about this is that this is a cycle a cycle of we have certain we have we perceive things a certain way we have a different a certain perspective on what happens which makes us have certain feelings which makes us have certain actions which then has reactions in the other so we saw the little kids sitting in the second row behind us and our first thoughts were why would anybody bring their kids to see Romeo and Juliet Ballet? This makes no sense. And why are there little kids like this sitting behind me at the ballet? And that led to certain feelings which, in truth, were annoyance. Then it could have led to an action which would have been a nasty one on my part, or a, a negative one, shall we say. I could have gotten an usher. I could have said something mean or to them. And that would have probably had quite a reaction. I don't even want to think about the reaction. It would have made somebody feel very, very bad, that's for sure. And that is not something I like to do in my life. Um, so that, that, but that would be the negative cycle. And that was the negative cycle that Jack was involved in. But it could be a positive cycle, as, as I feel very positive about what happened at the Kennedy Center, because we, we oh, wait a minute, you know, there's a good reason why these kids are here. Now we're, we have changed our feelings entirely. We're like feeling welcoming and, and boy, this is exciting. We now know the family of one of the dancers and it changed our actions completely and, and the reactions. And boy, was it fun at the end of the play when they took their stage um, uh, calls and uh, Mercutio was holding his little baby son up, 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 up with him on the stage. It was, it was very sweet. So that's why I, I, I think this is something that is really very important, is to think about either having a vicious cycle or a positive cycle. The other thing is that the interventions can be made anywhere along that thought and behavior record. So for example, if I go back to it, uh, and I have blanks of these that I give the kids, um, where along this, I'm sorry, where along this line would you, could you make an intervention to make this come out differently? Is there somewhere, something you could do differently? Um, you know, is there some way that you could change how you think about this? Is there some way that you could change what you do? 
that might make this come out differently. And of course, most kids will say, well, I want them to stop making fun of me. Well, we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. So what could you do? And there was young, one young man who I was seeing with his family who uh, had a big was having lots of fights with his mom in the morning. And uh, so you can see where anger is a theme, right, R that runs through how people not being able to regulate anger. That is, has been a theme in my practice. Um, and this young man, uh, they, they were having fights every morning, and he, we went through this chain with him. And the thing that finally got him to be willing to make some changes was that he could finally understand that the way he was acting was making his mother angry and yell at him. And he knew he didn't like that. So he was willing to make a change so that she wouldn't yell at him. That was the only thing. He didn't care that at that point that, he was, that, that she was upset. He just didn't like her yelling at him and making him walk to school and taking away all kinds of nice things. Um, so it is important, uh, I think, for us to try to look at this with kids to see where we might be able to intervene. Okay. So what I'd like to turn to is some ideas for um, how we can help kids learn these things. And there are, as I've said, some, some very interesting programs uh, for school curriculum. But there's also, I think, things that we at home can do with our children. Um, uh, first of all, of course, what we're modeling at home and how we're handling our own emotions and uh, how we understand the world is um, the, the most important thing that they're saying. And actually, emotional regulation begins in infancy. The, the, I don't, the, the, there's some very good research on that, interpersonal neurobiology, where they uh, have shown that it, during infancy, that attachment, that early attachment with parents, and it is both parents, mom and dad, that helps to wire the brain and helps children learn to regulate their emotions. Uh, but they also, so, so the, core, the beginnings of this are in infancy. And the, the child begins, in terms of the development of, of empathy, that children begin to be able to recognize themselves as different from the other by the time they're about one. They get, they get the idea that you're separate from me. And some of the research is showing that you can even begin to teach toddlers and preschoolers, there's programs even for teaching them uh, how to, to, to understand things from a different perspective and understand how others think and feel. Um, certainly we've seen a lot of sympathy in, in, in toddlers. I can remember um, hearing stories of kids, you know, somebody's crying and they go over to try to make them feel better. Um, so some, some other ideas that I've had for how to teach kids some of these skills um, are, you know, to go back to that, my chain there, the, the cycle. So if we change how we want, we want them to learn that if we can change how we treat people, they might also, uh, it might change how they think and feel and act towards us. So their behavior towards us may then, anyway, we get that cycle. I don't need to go through it again. Um, so we want to help children learn to label their own feelings. We want to help them learn to look at the same situation from different points of view. Um, and you can do that in family meetings. Um, when a, you can help them. It's really important that they understand how to read nonverbal cues. I, I have suggested things like, um, so you're feeling a certain way. Go look at yourself in a mirror and see what it looks like. See, what do you look like when um, you're scowling? What do you look like when you're angry? What does that look like? And then see if you can see that in another person. Or have the child check out with you. What is it that you're feeling right? You look mad, mom. What, what you know, do you feel mad, mom? 
or there was the time one of my children came up to me and I said to him, uh, I don't like to use my kids as examples, they're all grown up now, but uh, this one has always stuck in my head. Um, I was really in a bad mood one day and my son came up to me and was doing his usual exuberant self, being his, if you know Winnie the Pooh, his tiggerish self. And he was just bouncing and I, I finally looked at him and I said, son, I'm not gonna use his name, what do you think I'm feeling right now? And he looked at me and he said, mad. And I said, right. What do you, what do you think, um, and then I said to him, what do you think you should do? And he said, leave. I said, right. And he left. So it cooled the situation down. But that was, when I think back to that, that was training. Training and having him think about and read my nonverbal behavior and and think about what the, might, the, the next action might be. Um, and of course, it doesn't only happen once. One has to do these things multiple times over the course of raising a child. Some of the other ideas that, that I think are really good ones are to, when you're watching a movie or TV show with a child, to pause and just then think about what Imagine what are all the different, how are, they, how are the different characters seeing the same scene and what they might be, each person might be thinking or feeling or read a, the same book as your child and while you're reading, just you know, kind of think about who are, you know, what the different characters, how they might see that situation and what they might be feeling. Um, looking through some of those like photographs that I had up here looking through books. There are many books about feelings for kids now um, that uh, have, those are good things for, to do for and imagine um, how these people feel and why they might feel that way. Um, the other thing, things might be things like um, StoryCorps, interviewing a grandparent to understand how that person got to, to where they were. Uh, grandparents have long lives and, and, and oftentimes very interesting lives and uh, it's good for kids, I think, to get to know their, their grandparents. So actually, there was um, somebody who did this for a TED Talk, if you Google TED Talk StoryCorps, uh, they, where they actually set it up in a, in a special room where they were interviewing their grandparents. And I think it's a good way to learn about other people's perspectives. Um, I, I think I, I used to, when I would be driving around with my kids in the car, we would um, talk about, see the homeless on the street, and I would wonder with them, how did those people get to that place? What do you imagine happened that led them to this particular street corner? Um, and those would be, I think I was probably in, influenced by some reading that I had done on the, on the homeless and, and how, how they had gotten there, but it's just always a puzzle to me. And so wondering with your kids, being curious about how different people that you encounter in life, how did they get to this place? What is their story? M even making them up just to see that there might be different stories. Volunteering has been found to be to increase gratitude and to increase all kinds of, of uh, good feelings um, and to help people understand perspective to, and to have empathy. So I think that's another um, thing we can do to help kids learn. Mentoring has been found to be helpful where they have to mentor children in a younger class, a younger age, um, to teach them some of the, the skills that they need for uh, being kind. Um, one thing that parents and teachers can do I, is to think about what are your own strengths in terms of being able to model empathy and kindness. What are you doing? Uh, how are you doing? And, and what can you do to use your skills to impart this to these to these children, um, so how are you regulating your own emotions? How are you doing 
what are you doing that you could bring to teach your children and, and the children in your classes um, how, to, how to do this. I want to show you another video clip. I want to show you um, a clip about a, how kindness breeds kindness. That's, that's what is being found in the research literature, uh, that the more, that it, it's contagious. Kindness is contagious. And uh, this is a, a clip of a young man who thought of this on his own. And um, I was very struck by it, so I hope it will be of interest to you. Uh, well, the idea for this next Only in Canada story came from a viewer of The National, a high school teacher, Daryl Butchert, noticed one student doing something he found a bit odd. Well, it turns out that student opened a door to a whole new way of thinking. The school is Clark Road Secondary in London, Ontario. We'll let Joanna Remiliotis introduce you to the student. At first, no one knew who he was. We started uh, noticing this young man standing at the door, holding the door for um, 20 minutes at a time, five minutes at a time, day after day. Most people didn't know his name, so they simply gave him one. We call him Doorman. <laughs> the Doorman. The Doorman. We call him the Doorman. Have a good day. Thanks. See you later. Bye-bye. It's kind of scary to go to school. I didn't really want to. Every day I walked through the halls, I kind of felt like I was a ghost, kind of. Yeah. School has been hard on Josh Yont. He was bullied every day for years. They just tell me I'm, I'll never be good enough. Kind of tore me apart inside. Josh and his family moved to London last year. A new school, a new start. It was when he decided he didn't want to be invisible anymore. I just feel if I put myself out there and be something around too. And so it began. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. On his first day, and every day since. Hey, how are you? And why did you choose opening a door? Um, it's just uh, simple and uh, just a, welcome and just uh, effective. Thank People you. appreciate it. Welcome. I kind of surprised everybody at first because, you know, no one's really that nice at high school. It's high school. <laughs> I thought it was pretty strange. But after a while, I knew that he kept on doing it, so I thought it was good. Yeah. It was like, oh, he's the door. Yeah. But instead of becoming a target again, something remarkable happened. An example, like uh, one person in my hall, like they dropped their binder, and then uh, there's like two more, like two people rushing to help that person pick up all the papers. I find more and more people are willing to do that and go out of their comfort zone to say hi to people that they don't know. Since I've seen him do it, I've started opening doors, like others said. Like you want to be more positive towards other people. Okay. All right. We're good. How are you? Good. And Josh Welcome. saw the biggest change of all. No problem. Just watch what happens when we catch up with him in the hallway. People just love what I do. Uh, hey, hey, Josh. Hey, um, uh, it's uh, everyday. People always say thank you, and hey, uh, people smile, and yeah, it's really great. And it only gets better. Felt felt kind of special. On prom night, he was voted student with best personality and prom king. And I was like, okay, and then I get this, and I was like, oh, it's awesome. Your life has really changed. Yeah, for sure. Just from opening doors? Yeah. So I'm going to buy him, like, pink fuzzy His mom says she can't believe how much her son has changed. He's totally done the 360. He really has. You know, he's gone from very sad and almost depressed to, you know, happy, and he wants to go to school. <laughs> It's kind of stuck in a box before. And now I kind of came out no of hiding. Right. And found a new, better place just by daring to be kind. You have a good night. No problem. You wind up with CBC News, London, Ontario. The research that was presented at the Learning in the Brain conference a couple of weeks ago on, um, it's on the science of character. And there were a, a number of excellent speakers I've included in your um, handouts, some of the books written by some of those speakers. 
and um, they are finding that, in fact, kindness breeds kindness. And you know that um, to set up something in the classroom or the home uh, where it becomes expected that uh, you know then one thing, one change, like opening a, opening a door, what will that lead to? Um, they do not find, which is very interesting to me, that rewards help. In fact, one research study found that rewards backfired and didn't help, which I find very intriguing. Now that means, I think, concrete rewards. I think, thank you for doing that, which is actually a social reward. I think that kind of reward is, is a wonderful thing to do. You know, I really appreciated your bringing me that cup of hot tea when I wasn't feeling well. That was very nice of you. Um, but they, I think they're meaning, you know, like this is not the kind of thing we give M&Ms for or any other kind of tangible reward. I think you can probably see it on the street uh, when we're driving, uh, you know, when you let somebody in and maybe then you see them let somebody in ahead of you, hopefully. Um, who knows? Um, so this led me to think about a girl who I saw many years ago who was 16 years old and I mentioned something to her about the golden rule and she had never heard of it. She didn't know what it was. And I told her that it's to treat other people as you would want to be treated. And so I did some research on the golden rule and I've discovered that it's in every religion, all of them. Even humanism, you don't have to have a deity. The religions, with you, there's no deity necessary. But they all have this Buddhism, Hinduism, of course the Judeo-Christian religions, Islam, all of these religions have a statement in them. Um, ancient Egypt, going back is ancient Egypt, that which you hate to be done to you, do not do to another. Ancient Greece, what you do not want to happen to you, do not do it to your, do not do it yourself either. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. In Islam, love your brother as you love yourself. So in all of these, uh, every, it, it exists everywhere and I think it is something that needs to be taught. I think it's the foundation of the world I'd like to live in and I'd like my grandchildren to grow up in. Um, so I guess I forgot to show you this, which mindfulness meditation was also all over the uh, conference I was at a few weeks ago, that this could be found to be extremely helpful for kindness, which I find very, very interesting, a very intriguing thought that just, um, I don't know if um, any of you are as interested in this, but I find it extremely, mindfulness meditation is being found to be very helpful for all kinds of things, but apparently also for uh, kindness and uh, treating other people well. Okay, so what I wanted to conclude with is that Empathy, the ability to understand how other people think and feel, opens the door to compassion and to kindness. And that compassion and kindness are contagious. And that we can develop these skills over the course of our life, lifetimes. That the brain continues to develop. And so it's not fixed. We can, these are teachable. We can teach these skills. And so I leave you with that, that perhaps we can change the world one child at a time. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I will take questions, and I will repeat each question. She's asking about uh, a child she has, one of three, who it has, no matter what she has done, and like most, many parents I have met, you are really working very hard. Um, she cannot get him to understand the impact of his behavior on other people. I think it, that's a good summary. And so if you remember, I talked about that continuum. And so he would be at the end of the continuum where he's having almost, it's impo almost impossible for him to be able to take perspective. So, um, 
I'm not saying it, there's no easy answer to that question of how to do this. It's going to, it, what you would have to do is think about build, the building blocks. What's the basic building block here? And the, the first building block for a child like that is going to be, you know, they call it theory of mind. He does not have the ability to understand that there are other minds. That's how I think of it anyway, that there are other minds that are different than his. So the, the teachable, first teachable thing, task is going to be to have him understand that other people see things differently than he does. I suspect he can't do that. So the question is, is it that he is choosing not to he, or that he can't? And that is an excellent question. Um, and I, th there's only one way I can think of to answer this, so I will, I will just go with it. Um, at the Passover Seder, <laughs> uh, we talk about in, in the... In the Haggadah, which is the, the book that we read um, at that time the, from, from Exodus, there are uh, four children that are described as part of this uh, Seder. I don't know if any of you has ever been to a Passover Seder, but they talk about four children. And the, the four children, if, and now I hope I remember them, the, the wise one who, who wants to know the story of the Exodus, and the simple one who is interested, but we need to explain it very, very simply. And then there's the child who does not even want to know, is not curious, just doesn't want to know. And right now I'm forgetting the fourth one. Maybe somebody here will remember. But for the child that, you know, <laughs> for the child that does, and I, I make that association. Doesn't know even the question to ask. One to, thank you. The one that doesn't know even the question to ask. That's right. And I'm not sure, I think the child you're describing is the one, is either the one that doesn't know to ask or the one that doesn't care. And in the Seder, we talk about for the one that doesn't care, we have to give them a good reason to care. And that's where, um, and I understand your point that there are people in the world that don't care what the impact of, is of their behavior on other people or don't care that other people have a different perspective. And that was where I gave you the example with that whole thought and behavior record of uh, the young man where the only way I could start to get him to care about it was because of the impact it had on him. So I felt like at least I got a foot in the door that way. We've got to give them a reason to care. And the re sometimes the reason with a person like that is going to be a kind of self-centered self kind of reason or self-serving kind of reason that my life will be better if I don't do this because other people will treat me better. For some kids, they might, they might get that first step of, of doing an intervention because it might serve me better, but how can we further that? How can we carry it out to make them want to care? To, to make them want to care? Um, I'm not going to pretend these are easy, help. right, or help them. First of all, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being a, a little uh, naive in, in the sense that this, this is all assuming that there aren't any other deeper problems, okay? There, you know, the, there often are. There are many reasons why kids fight with their parents They're, that are not not caring about impact of their behavior. So it, it's, it's often not simple. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, I think with a, well, in, in some of the groups that I have led for kids like this, we did things like watching, um, you know, what was the, the TV sitcom with Sheldon in it? Um, Big Bang Theory. Big Bang Theory. Thank you very much. Um, we would watch selected episodes. Now, all of those episodes are not uh, suitable or not appropriate, but there were selected episodes where we could we would pause and watch the behavior of the different participants and see what everybody in the group they would talk about what they thought. And so, I think that what I'm trying to say is is that 
sometimes you have to do lots of different of these things that not one is going to work, but we've got to try lots of different things to teach them. And that I guess also that two other things I'd like to say. One is that some people are more teachable than others. I just don't want to give up on them. I mean, whether you know your children can can get this, I don't know, but I think continuing to try to model and teach this is a worthy goal. Um, you know, the continuum exists. Some people get it easily and some people don't get it. And some people can get it m with, with help. Um, but I don't want to give up on them. And the other point is that the brain is continuing to develop. As I'm sure all of you know, um, you know, the brain does, or most of you probably know, the brain doesn't finish developing until we're in our mid to late 20s. And, you know, so, and the part of the brain that's going to be involved in uh, these kinds of processes, many of the, directing these kinds of processes, is, is the last to come online. So I, I'm gonna have hope. Uh, but what I would say to you is that what, what I've tried to do is think about the building blocks. And they're not done in necessarily sequentially, they're gonna have to be done at the same, together. And it's not a one-time intervention. That's, it has to be done over and over again. And I, I do think that um, some people, just like um, some people can learn languages very easily, and for some people it's harder, I think this is just another one of those, I, I see it as another one of those skills. So she's a stepmom, which adds a whole different level of complexity uh, to the story, wondering about the um, comments that I made about my son and having him read my nonverbal cues. Um, by, uh, first of all, that was one of my finer moments as a, as a mother, um, <laughs> I, I have to say. Um, I don't even know that he remembers it, but they weren't all that fine, I just want to point out. Um, the other thing I have to say is that being a stepmother is extremely difficult and adds another whole level of dimension to this thing. I don't know, you know, you, um, and, and you may not know the child well enough yet to be able to be engaging in any of these interactions. But it, it could be helpful for him to just, you know, for you to show him, you know, this is what I look like when I'm happy. How could, I, how could I help a child with ADHD who has difficulty with reading nonverbal cues get to uh, a better place of understanding? And the first thing is probably going to be to get them to stop. <laughs> to, you know, to, uh, because kids with ADHD have difficulty with the brain's breaking mechanism and they don't, you know, it's hard for them. They're, they're very, tend to be very impulsive. So, you know, the first thing is stop and look and listen. Look at my face, listen to my nonverbal cues. What is it that you are hearing? So, you know, and, and gently done over and over again, that might be a way of doing it. But the first thing would be to get him to stop. So the question is one of that you can, she can see that her daughter is starting to have uh, interactions with her peers that are going to cause problems for her later, but she doesn't know how to broach the, the subject with her because she doesn't want to make her feel bad or doesn't want to increase her anxiety. Um, and th that is one I hear about a lot, uh, and, and it really is tough because you, you really don't want to hurt her feelings. I think um, one possible, does she ever come to you with concerns herself? She hasn't realized that. So this is the child who doesn't even know what question to ask. She doesn't know there's a problem. She's not aware. She doesn't, she's not aware there's a problem. The only thing I can think of is that um, it, it's tough. That, that's very hard. Is to bring up, well, first of all, the idea of family meetings comes to my mind, which is I don't know if, if anybody still does family meetings, but um, Sunday night family meetings over popcorn I still think is a, is a great idea and just talking about things that are going on. 
Um, I don't know if siblings might have noticed something. And the other thing would be just in a quiet moment for you to just be curious with, with her as to whether she's noticed something specific that happened. Um, in other words, not in a critical, judgmental kind of way, but just to start to bring it to her attention. The other thing, I know that um, you've said she's done social skills groups. Social skills, which I think very highly of, generally uh, in, in those groups, they're teaching skills like how to initiate a conversation, how to continue a conversation, how to make friends, how to keep, all of those kinds of things. What we're really talking about is Michelle Garcia Winters, uh, uh, the, the way she phrased it is uh, social thinking or social cognition. So that what we are at here is at a level that's a basis for social skills. So, this, so you might be looking for a group for her where they work on social thinking and social cognition. So something like if you go to socialthinking.com, which is in my list of resources, you might find some other, there are some people who in the area who have taken training with Michelle Garcia Winner and are at this different level of learning perspective taking and learning to understand that, know the impact of your behavior on others. Um, those kinds of groups might be more satisfying uh, for, for some kids. For some kids, the social skills groups are very appropriate. So you've got a seventh grader and you are sensing the frustration in the room that we all as parents are doing everything we can and, and yes, this makes sense, but the kids won't buy into it and, and don't get it. And is there something that else that we could do? And um, the answer is have patience. The answer is that the, their brains are growing, that they are growing, that I, mean, I have kind of a longitudinal point of view, having been in practice for 33 years and raised two kids who are in their 30s and I'm now a grandma. Um, you know, so I have a, a kind of long-term perspective that they're probably going to be fine as adults. They're going to find careers where they can use their strengths, where maybe they won't have to interact as much with people or they will get better at this but probably it's going to have to come from inside them that you can't make this happen much as we would like to I mean, I mean it depends on um, how we view our children do we view them as you know sculptures that we have to create or do we view them as sand where they or, or something where they will create themselves and we're there to watch them develop to, to support their development but I think some frustration can come from having a goal in mind of how we want our children to be and we I think we for their own happiness right well. for their own happiness as well and of course I mean that is true um, I would like you to keep in mind that the goal of parenting, everybody says to me, we just want our kids to be happy. Well, actually, there is the story of the boy who was living in his parents' basement at age 25, and when the therapist tried to get him out of the basement, he said, well, my parents have told me my whole life they just wanted me to be happy, and I'm perfectly happy living in their basement playing video games. So actually, that is not your goal as a parent. Your goal as a parent is, I believe, this is my belief, to raise your child to be an independently functioning, contributing member of society, preferably between the ages of 25 and 30. I used to say to 25, I've had to extend it, with their own health insurance. <laughs> now, it would be really nice if they could also be happy, as happy as any of us is, right? Um, so, you know, that's what I submit to you, is that that is really your goal, and that what you want them to be is socialized. 
you want them to be able to get along in the social world. That you do want. And that is something that requires teaching and, uh, and reinforcement at home, a lot of. And it's going to be, at age, I, I have a, a wonderful interactive of how, where the brain is at seventh, in seventh grade. This is a really hard age in terms of brain development. And the next years, if you've read anything on the adolescent brain, it's going to be changing a whole lot over the next few years. In your, in your family. And it's worth reading about. It is. There's a book that um, Dan Siegel just came out with called Brainstorm that is quite good on the adolescent brain and what's happening. And, you know, adolescence is a wonderful time, too. It's a tremendous time of, of growth in the brain. Um, ap apparently, what I under, I'm digressing. I don't know if this is of any, I'm fascinated in the adolescent brain. Anyway, I, I just, um, you know, it's, it's a, a grand time. Um, the way my husband puts it is that uh, you, you can, it's like you get to go visit a foreign country, <laughs> but you don't have to leave your house. You know, they've got their own style of dress. They've got their own language, right? They've got their own things they're interested in, and you don't have to go anywhere. Um, what actually happens is that the Olympics, as, as, I, as Jay G had explained it at the conference a couple of days ago, he's uh, kind of the... Uh, foremost researcher, one of the big researchers on the adolescent brain, that the two parts of the brain, the part that controls emotions, uh, develops at a different pace than the executive function part of the brain. The, the lower part of the brain, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but you know the primitive part of the brain develops at a different pace than the outer thinking cortex. And so you know, it's all out of whack. So that risk taking gets in there, and there's no inhibit, nothing to stop it. So it's you know it can be a wild ride. So I'm just telling you this so that you're you know, that's why I say the best thing you can do is have patience, and know that your job is to get them through adolescence, through childhood, hopefully with you know no major problems with the law, no major medical issues, and understand that they will likely be fine as adults. You've given them good parenting. I know you're all concerned parents who've been here. <laughs>